hell is breaking out all over the city. Absolutely. People, people falling through floors, babies, and dying in feces and, and, and boo-boo. Right. And, and, and we, can, we don't have nothing to say about it. Right. Doing dope deals in the parking lot of the church. Dope right. houses are all around the church. Hey. That we can see. Hey, Joe, I got, I got to get to this next topic, man. But thanks for calling in. Keep listening, okay? Thanks for calling in. Okay, all right. So um, read the article from uh, NBCNews.com. Uh, Duncan employee calls police on students speaking Somali with their family. Uh, quote, I don't want to hear it. I'm done with it. You can leave or I will call the police. End quote. The Portland, Portland Maine employee could be heard saying, on video. Uh, very quickly here, and then we're going to get to this other story. A student activist said a Duncan employee in Portland, Maine, refused service and called police on her after a dispute started because she was speaking the Somali language with her family. Uh, Hamdia Ahmed, who's 20 years old, says she and her family were having a conversation in their car while waiting in the Dunkin' uh, Donut drive through on this past Monday when the employee working at the window asked them to stop yelling. Quote, we were just speaking in our native language. We weren't yelling, end quote, Hamid told NBC News. Um, and uh, Hamid captured the uh, resulting argument on video, which he posted on Twitter, okay? And uh, you're, going, you're going to disrespect me because I speak a different language, than you is that what it is okay so uh, check out this um, check out this article uh, also as well and we'll post this here on the thread of our broadcast we have to start a new broadcast on uh, Facebook our Facebook fan page the African History Network uh, the phone was freezing up so we have to start a new broadcast all right I want to go I want to revisit uh, continue with the discussion from the last week I want to go back to um, Roland Martin's show from October 11th, 2018, Roland Martin Unfiltered, where he dealt with uh, Kanye West meeting Donald Trump. He, uh, and Roland had a panel discussion. On that panel discussion uh, was uh, Dr. Greg Carr, who's the chair of the Afro-American Studies Department. And this segment here talked about land ownership. Let's uh, take a listen to this. I want to say it's great to have you guys with us. And, and we're going to go and meet them. That's about at the 23 minute mark. Uh, okay. Gotcha. That was quite something. That was quite something. That was from the soul. I yeah, did it. Yeah. So you you had said of, of President Bush that he doesn't care about black people, and you've heard some people say that about this president. What do you, how do you respond to that? What do you think of that? I think we need to care about all people, and I believe that when I went on to NBC, I was very emotional, and I was programmed to think from a victimized mentality, a, a, a welfare mentality. I think that with, with blacks and African Americans, we really get caught up in the idea of racism over the idea of industry. We say if people don't have land, they settle for brands. We want uh, polo sport and Obama again. We want a brand more than we want land because we haven't known how it feels to actually have our own land and have ownership of our own blocks. So when you don't have ownership, we don't know what it feels like to have ownership of our own blocks. Kanye, you might want to go look up Rosewood to see what black people own. You might want to go look up, of course, uh, Wall Street uh, near Tulsa to understand that. You might want to go look at those black towns that black people created in North Carolina and Virginia. The reality, Kanye, is after slavery, after the Civil War, black folks who were not given land, who were not given money, who were not given horses, who were not given anything, actually put their meager resources together to actually create their own communities, buy their own land, and open their own stores. That is what happened. But what you need to quite understand, Kanye, is because of systemic racism and white supremacy in this country, so black clip. land was stolen go, go from African Americans. In the fact, last. you had individuals when black yeah. folks yeah. dare to even speak out about voting, saying? then they said, yeah, we're not going to extend yeah. you any credit uh, when it came it to the says. store in town, so, so therefore they, they like couldn't even buy one one any goods to actually farm their own land, which forced them out to give up their land. There were black people who had to, who were forced out of Mississippi. Mississippi, of Alabama, of Georgia, of Tennessee, of Arkansas, due to racism, and they literally packed their families up 
from those places and left the land because white folks said, how dare you stand up for your rights? And so please don't sit in the Oval Office and dare say, Kanye, that black people have never actually owned anything when we have undeniable facts of black people owning land, owning stores, owning those things. In fact, when you also begin uh, to look at the details in terms of what we've done, We've done those things, but you somehow keep saying that uh, racism is a figment of our imagination and we just keep focusing on that whole thing and uh, how you have been able to do these amazing things. You could not do a damn thing if Harry Belafonte didn't do it, if Paul Robeson didn't do it, if Sidney Poitier didn't do it, if Barry Gordy didn't do it. Those were the people who took the daggers of Jim Crow, who took the indignity of not being able to walk through the front door and have to walk through the back door to allow you to be able to to do what you do in music. Don't you dare act as if what they endured, somehow they were weak and somehow you are so much stronger when they paved the way for you to be able to do what you did. Press play. Okay. Let's pause it's it right all there. about how something We're gonna pause it right there. Okay, so that was, uh, I'm gonna play uh, another segment of that, of that clip also. I want you to hear Dr. Um, Grant Carr, who's the chair of the Afro-American Studies Department at Howard University break it down. You know, we've had Dr. Greg Carr here on the show before. He's a friend of mine, and when I used to guest host Roland Martin's national radio show a lot, I would have, I, I had Dr. Greg Carr on frequently. Okay, so look at the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, AtlantaBlackStar.com, um, from June 30th, 2017. From 15 million acres to 1 million, how black people lost their land. From 15 million acres, from 15 million acres to 1 million acres, how black people lost their land by David A. Love. African Americans, in 1920, we owned 15 million acres of land, and we owned 925,000 farms. By, 1979, by 1975, it dropped down to 45,000 farms, and we own uh, only about 1 million acres of land today. Here's an excerpt from this article. At its height, black ownership was impressive. At the turn of the 20th century, formerly enslaved black people and their heirs owned 15 million acres of land primarily in the South, mostly used for farming. In 1920, the 925,000 uh, African American farmers uh, represented 14% of the farms in America. Sadly, Things turned for the worse, as 600,000 black farmers were forced off their land, with only 45,000 black farms remaining in 1975. Now, African Americans are only 1% of rural landowners in the U.S. and under 2% of farmers. Of the 1 billion acres of arable land in America, Black people today own a little more than one million acres, according to the Associated Press. During the Obama administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture settled with black farmers for $2.3 billion for their long-standing claims of discrimination in farm loans and other government programs. See, people don't want to talk about it. It was President Obama that paid the black farmers their settlement money, okay? Over the years, black people have lost their land through a number of circumstances, including government action, deception, and a reign of domestic terror in the South. A reign of domestic white terrorism in the South that forced black people from their homes through threats of violence and lynching. That terror and economic exploitation precipitated the Great Migration, the Great Migration of about 1915 to 1970. We have 5 million to 6 million African Americans migrate from the south up north and out west. Many of them are fleeing domestic terrorism. The Great Migration, which resulted in the uprooting of over six million African Americans uh, uh, from the south in their, uh, okay, in their relocation. All right, so uh, read this extensive article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, which short on time, I don't have to share as much of it with you as I want to. And they talk about one specific case of an African American man who was killed for his land and this land taken over, taken over by white people. Okay? Um, now, let's go to this uh, last segment here. This is Dr. Greg Carr. He was a panelist on the panel discussion 
uh, from Rolling Show dealing with Kanye's meeting with um, uh, Donald Trump. Let's go to this clip here. Somebody called the, the commission. The county commission. No, to the same clip. The same clip. Because they oh, the same clip. Folks get on this I said, I said, I said, the one hour, I said, one hour in, one hour, 20 seconds in, put, put me back on, just cue it up, okay, okay, we'll get that, we'll get that queued up, we'll get that queued up uh, here in just a minute, all right, uh, because Dr. Greg Carr is talking on that, uh, in this segment here, it's right at about one, uh, one hour, 20 seconds in. All right. And uh, then I, I want to do a little more with the history of how African-Americans became uh, Democrats. A really good article from uh, really good article from uh, history dot house dot gov history dot house dot gov. Now, house dot gov is the official website of the U.S. House of Representatives. And this article is entitled Party Realignment party realignment why african americans became democrats party realignment okay this deals with why african americans became democrats and it talks about how the political realignment of black voters set in motion at the close of reconstruction gradually accelerated in the 20th century pushed by demographic shifts such as the great migration that we just talked about and by black discontent with the increasingly conservative racial policies of the Republican Party in the South. Okay, we got it queued up? Uh -huh. Okay, let's go uh, to Dr. Greg Carr. Mentally challenged, uh, who's clearly got some health, some health challenges, I would say, really just dissemble like that. The only other thing I would add is, I think that video, just watch it as one piece, that's a beautiful example of mental illness. Two mentally ill people talking to each other as if they don't both need severe intervention. And yeah, it was, I would, I, would, I would probably say somewhat of the opposite. I think she would look down and be very proud of her son. And the reason why is he's sitting at the table. And I get, I totally understand what you mean in, in regards to facts. But your role in Martin, I've been watching you on television probably for the last you know, two decades. You have the facts. That's your profession. Kanye West is an entertainer. He was raised on two college campuses. Here's, 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 why, yeah. here's why I will not let him be an entertainer off the hook. That's right. And I see Davis was an entertainer. Mm -hmm. Ruby D was an entertainer. Right. Dick Gregory was an entertainer. Right. Harry Belafonte is an entertainer. Mm -hmm. Paul Robeson is a, was an entertainer. Right. Sidney Poitier is an entertainer. Mm -hmm. John Legend is an entertainer. Lettucey is an entertainer. Common is an entertainer. Yeah, Kerry Washington is an entertainer. Right. Uh, State uh, Erica Ash is an entertainer. Mm -hmm. I can go on and on and on and name you. Jeffrey Wright is an right. entertainer. Right. Hold on one second. I'm not done. Right. Don Cheadle is an entertainer. I can go on and on and on. These are individuals who at least will attempt to read. And his mother they, was an they, academic. Talk to him. He was raised right. on this, 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 this is not a guy no. who... Come on. This guy... Right. This is a guy whose mama was a college professor. And took him to class. Bruh. <laughs> I, I mean, come, you let them off the hook. No, no something's wrong with that, off the hook. What I'm trying to say is that what I saw is a person that's sitting at the table. He brought up some very important issues to the President of the United States. No, no, no. The no. President of the United States talked, to your point, in Chicago about stopping and frisk, and he said that that wouldn't probably be good for the community. What? I think the stop and frisk. Who Kanye, said that? Kanye said that. Right. He said it probably But then he said, oh, I'm sorry to put you on blast. Hey, no, no, here, here's my whole point. When you at the table, mm -hmm. he, Kanye was not talking to him. Right. Kanye was talking to the cameras. At no point did Kanye say, Mr. President, in your budget, you're cutting mental health. Restore it. Mr. President, you're cutting education. Restore it. Mr. President, you came to my city two days ago and declared stop and frisk should be national policy. That, sir, is wrong. I'm here to tell you you should rescind that. Roland, that's the most I've ever heard Kanye West talk before in my life. But let me well, actually, I've heard him talk longer than that. And I still didn't hear you, you gave over almost 30 minutes of your show to watch that. What I'm trying to say is when I look at that, you can look at other young men around this country, other young black men in Chicago 
that may have similar dreams to Kanye, that you can actually make it to the point that you're in the Oval no, Office. No, see, like see, this, see, this is, I like this the is, point he made in regards of how he felt <laughs> and Jim Brown, how they felt in the Oval Office. Well, here's the deal, though. I like those you, you, Okay, you can like how they felt oh, in the Oval Office. Like, like, but, but if, oh. First of all, you oh. can have your opinion. One hour, but when I'm opposite the it's very probably, man who has wow. policies that are completely opposite of what I'm advocating, and I'm just happy to be there. Which is your opinion? Well, I'm no, 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 hold on, no, no. That's not opinion. The, the, the entire no, no, segment, bro, the that, entire on. segment That's was about opinion. you being right and him being wrong. No, 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 no. stop, That's stop, it. stop. That's what it was See, here's where you're wrong. <laughs> My segment was about what the details are. Right. Can you refute a single detail Let's I pause offer? it right there. Okay. Um, and in that same clip, uh, watch this on YouTube. Um, go to Roland Martin on YouTube. Uh, Kanye met Trump at White House. Um, it, that's from October 11, 2018. That's the full. They went over a minute. Okay. Dr. Greg Carr talked about, uh, he gave an example of sitting at the table. He gave the example of uh, A. Philip Randolph threatening to put 100,000 people uh, on to march on Washington, threatening President Franklin Roosevelt. Okay. And this was Executive Order 8802 which opened up jobs in the Defense Department for African-Americans. And we got a lot of these jobs when we were moved during the Great Migration. Uh, go to Britannica.com, Britannica.com, search for Executive Order 8802. But that, that is being at the table and um, uh, demanding something and making a threat to push your political agenda. This is what A. Philip Randolph did, who was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. This is documented history. Uh, if we go back to the article quickly here from uh, history, uh, history.house.gov, this deals with party realignment, party realignment, and this deals with the history behind why African Americans became, was switched from the Republican Party to the, to the Democratic Party. A decades-long process ensued in which blacks were effectively pushed outside or left the Republican fold because of its increasingly ambiguous racial policies. By the end of this era, uh, the major parties' uh, policies and a re-emergent activism among younger act African Americans positioned uh, blacks for a mass movement in the early and mid-1930s to the Northern Democratic Party because you had the Southern Democrats, the Dixie Dixiecrats, as uh, Malcolm X called them. They were part of the Democratic Party, but you had African Americans who were realigning themselves with the Northern Democrats, okay? So, you you had uh, the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan uh, going back to 1915 because of the movie The Birth of a Nation, and this ushered in a reign of violence buttressed by public shows of power, like um, uh, there was a demonstration at the U.S. Capitol in 1926 of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and you had um, weakened to the point of irrelevancy, Southern Republicans after 1900 curried favor with the political part, with the political power structure to preserve their grasp on local patronage jobs dispensed by the National Party. Therefore, Southern white uh, Republican officials embraced Jim Crow. Southern white Republican officials embraced Jim, Jim Crow. This goes back to the early uh, 1900s and 1920s. Uh, through political factions such as the Lily White Movement, the Lily White Movement, which excluded blacks and black and tan societies, T-A-N, which extended only token political roles to African Americans, the party gradually ceased to serve as an outlet for the politically active cadre of Southern African Americans, okay? And then you, you have to look at the 1928 presidential campaign. Uh, where uh, Herbert Hoover was the Republican nominee and the Northern Democrat Al Smith was the Democratic uh, nominee, okay? And um, uh, through, uh, uh, though a majority of African Americans cast their vote for Herbert Hoover, who was a Republican, black defection from the party was greater than in any prior election. Manufacturers of public opinion within the African American community, including the Chicago Defender newspaper and the Baltimore African American, um, are going to support Al Smith. Meanwhile, the party of Lincoln seemed unresponsive to the changing electorate, okay? And as time goes on, now by 1960, when John F. Kennedy runs against uh, Richard Nixon and Kennedy wins, 
by 1960, two thirds of African Americans had switched over, and it deals with also President Roosevelt and the and policies of the New Deal that caused African Americans to switch over. We're dealing with policies. We're dealing with getting our issues met. Okay, we'll pick this up uh, some more next week because this is a, a deep, deep history that we need to understand. We'll be joined by Dr. Claude Anderson uh, next week on the show also, and we'll deal with how to leverage our economics to push our political agenda. Hey, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can listen to podcasts of our shows there, watch videos. We have our DVD lectures there. You can donate to the African History Network as well. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Stay tuned for Pastor Mo. We'll talk to you next week. Peace. There's Jack Lessonbury here. All right, guys. We got to get out of here, out of time. Uh, visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and uh, you can support us. I'll respond to your comments uh, later tonight or when I get home. Okay, talk to you later. Peace.